Hey guys, welcome back to another free training in real estate school. Today's training is all about creative financing. How so easy, we close fast and any time that works for you. Your house don't need it, we'll throw cash, it hits so fast, don't know what to do. Hey guys, welcome back to another free training in real estate school. I'm so happy you are here. Today's training is all about creative financing. And I love using creative financing. Creative financing is such a great approach. So that is what we're going to cover today in real estate school, creative financing. I have used creative financing to buy tons of properties and I love teaching and coaching people to also use creative financing. Creative financing allows for you to get creative. And the great thing about this is, is that there's not really like one way to do it, right? There's infinite ways of doing creative financing because it's all about how creative you can be and how creative you can become. So typically speaking, when creative finance is used, it's when the seller themselves becomes the lender or you take over their existing loan, but you're not essentially going and walking into a bank or a credit union or even necessarily going and talking to a private or hard money lender to go secure the financing to gain control of the property, regardless if you're going to buy it, fix and flip it, rent it, whatever, it doesn't matter. You got to gain control of a property before you are going to be able to make money on it. And creative financing can be that approach. It can be a tool to help you acquire more properties. So I have a short presentation for you folks today. I'm going to clean up my workspace and get comfortable here. We don't need our whiteboard here. And let's jump in. Unlocking the power of creative financing. All right. Discover the world of creative finance and learn how it can benefit both the buyers and the sellers in real estate transactions. Get ready for some game-changing insights here, folks. This is such a great tool to help you buy more properties so you can make more money when it comes to real estate investing. Okay, what is seller financing? Let's start simple. Let's start to where you know we can actually kind of cover this in detail for those that you know may not... Um, essentially know much about it, right? Seller financing is a type of creative financing that allows buyers to secure a loan directly from the seller. They're going to bypass the traditional lending institution, right? So this is a win-win situation for both parties, which I'm going to get into here in just a second. Buyer gets access to financing without the strict credit requirements of these banks or local lenders, right? While the sellers get to sell their properties quickly faster, convenience. That's what we're always offering as real estate investors is convenience. We're offering convenience to people. Okay. So some of the benefits for the buyer, and again, this is just a couple, there's a lot, is that there is a lower down payment requirement, right? You don't need to bring 20% to the table. You can take over an existing loan, which might be no down payment, or you can get the seller to be the bank and finance you the, the, the money that's needed to buy the deal over time. It's typically going to be faster and it's going to be a simpler process because you're not needing to go get financing and apply and do all the hoops and jumps and all the stuff to get those loans. There is no need for a mortgage lender, right? This is great because there's an existing one in place or the seller can become that. And then, of course, the flexible payment terms, it's all about how creative you want to get, right? The more creative you get, the, the better. So the terms, again, they're not really like, you know, white and black. It can be 50,000 shades of, of gray. It all depends on what you and the seller discuss and agree upon, okay? So the benefits for the seller, speaking of the seller, is that they're going to have a higher demand for buyers because they're going to be able to offer more money. Also, most buyers don't have a you know piles of cash laying around. So if you don't, you can be a buyer on these type of deals. You just got to agree sometimes to pay a little bit more or make it a little bit more interesting for the seller. Faster property sales for the sellers, right? They're not waiting for somebody to come along and pay them asking price or even more so have to go get approved for a loan for that number. They can be the lender. Okay, and this is seller financing specifically, not so much sub two, but I am talking a little bit about that. We're going to get into that in a second. Next is potential for higher sale price. I did mention that, uh, but essentially the sellers are going to have some benefits to using seller financing versus just selling it because they're going to be able to collect interest in some cases and or charge more money for the property. And they also may not want all the money right away for tax implications. 
So there's additional benefits. We're going to get into that too in a second here. They're going to have potential for a higher sale and they're going to have a steady income over monthly payments versus getting it all lump sums. Some sellers actually prefer to not have all the money today and get the money over 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, right? So it's very, very beneficial to both parties, all right? Subject to financing. Let's talk about that now, just for a second. Let me see if I can make this a little smaller where it fits. Oh, I can scroll. Perfect. Okay. Subject to financing. Let me move my little guy. Here we go. How does it work? Subject to financing is another form of creative financing, all right, just like seller financing. But in subject to financing, the buyer, you, me, the investor, right, we're going to take over the existing mortgage of the seller. So keep in mind that when we are doing this, the seller has to agree to that. And they typically have to be motivated to some degree to just allow you to take over their mortgage versus you just paying it off and them not having any attachment to this. Just want to throw that out there. But when a seller is motivated enough, this is very common. Okay. This allows the buyer to purchase the home without the need for the traditional mortgage, like we just mentioned. But it's also a unique approach that can yield great results for the buyers and the sellers alike because it can help a seller sell a deal that they might not otherwise be able to sell. But it can be great for a buyer because not only do we not need the mortgage in today's economy, folks, I just refied a property this morning. And I paid six and a half percent interest on a five year term. Um, through a credit union with a 25 year AMWR, five over 25, six and a half percent. Seven weeks ago, I paid eight and a half percent to refinance a property. So I got, you know, what is that? That is uh, two full percentage points less over seven weeks. But even at six and a half, that can be high compared to somebody that might have got a mortgage. All right. At let's say they got a mortgage, you know, four or five years ago, and they may have a rate of 2.5, 2.9. 1.9, you can take over these existing mortgages, right? And have lower rates and also be into the amortization schedule a little bit, which is a little bit more advanced. Let's stick to the training here. We'll talk about those things later. Okay. So what typically is the, you know, approach to going about doing a subject to deal? Well, one, step one, you need to find a, a, a motivated seller, a seller that has a high level of motivation. Typically subject to financing is going to work best. When the seller is motivated to get out of the property quickly or to get out of the obligation to cover the mortgage. This is often the case with a foreclosure or distressed properties or distressed property owners. You know, somebody that may be moving for a job, right? And they, they, they got to go. They're, they're gone. They move and they have this house and they can't sell it. They might be underwater in it. Or maybe they owe essentially what it's worth and they, they can't afford to bring money to the table to sell it. And they don't want their credit to, come, to go to hell. So we can come in and we can say, listen, you know, we'll take over the payments of this property. You know, the goal would be to have it refinanced or sold within three to five years. Uh, but, you know, we would like to essentially go into a deal with you and take over these payments and, and relieve you of this obligation. And the terms of the deal can be whatever you discuss. There's no, you know, fixed thing. But again, that's step one. We're going to find a seller. That's typically step one, folks no matter what kind of real estate we're investing we're doing. We typically need to find a seller, talk to them, make a friend with them, offer to help them, and then, of course, make an offer to purchase the home with or without creative financing. Creative financing is the topic today. All right, number two, right? Step two, agree on the purchase price. All right, the buyer and the seller agree on a purchase price that's going to be equal to or less than, sometimes above, where they walk with some money, but typically it's going to be equal to or less than the current mortgage balance. All right. And you're going to, most of the time, it's going to be the mortgage balance. You're just going to take over. Sometimes I will, you know, bring money to close. Sometimes I will, uh, I'm not typically making money at closing on a subject to deal, right? I'll pay a little or I'll pay, or I'll agree to, to pay what they pay and just relieve them of the problem. Sometimes too, keep in mind, they may be behind on their mortgage. If it's a pre-foreclosure, foreclosure type situation, they may be four or five months behind. In order for you to buy it subject to, you'll, you will need to catch those payments up to prevent it from going into foreclosure. So sometimes you may need to, to do what's, a, what's called catching up the mortgage and getting it current. Uh, but again, it's very simple. You're going to have to agree on a price, right? So find the seller, agree on a price. Next, take over those payments. Very simple. 
the buyer takes over the mortgage payments without it actually obtaining a new loan. This means that the original mortgage stays in place. The deed transfers from them to you or them to your LLC or them to your trust. You are the new owner of the property, but the mortgage is in their name, not yours. And you should have a high, high level of integrity and ethics and do everything in your power to pay that payment. And if you can't, for whatever reason, and you get in trouble, you should be in communication with that person. This is a human you're working with here. Have some respect, right? You don't want to necessarily just go buy properties and take them over and then not make the payments and then screw them over with their credit. You got to form a friendship and a bond with these people. You're essentially joint venturing with them in a way, okay? Step four, agree on the payment terms. The buyer and the seller agree on a payment terms, including expected sale or refinance date. You know, maybe you're doing a do the a subject to, to, to maturity. Maybe you're telling the sellers you're going to do three or five years with this deal. And your plan is to rehab it, sell it, refinance it, and to get that loan out of their name, okay? Or the buyer just takes over the existing mortgage until maturity, like I mentioned, right? So there's a couple of different ways. And again, that's kind of the advantage of creative financing and subject to is, is that you can get creative. You can catch up a mortgage. You can take over payments. You can even pay them a little, a little sometimes and then take over the payments, it really doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's all about what you guys agree on. Okay. What are the benefits of subject to financing? Well, subject to financing can be a great option for both the buyers and the sellers, like I mentioned. And, you know, both parties can expect, you know, to gain from this type of creative financing. So the benefits for the buyers, no need for a down payment, flexible payment options, no need for traditional mortgages, allows for a quick property purchase. Benefit for the sellers, fast property purchase. Everybody wins on that one. Steady income from the mortgage payments, assuming that they're doing seller financing. Again, they can sell it for a higher price because they're not getting cash today. They're the bank. So that's the, that's the trade-off. And then, and then also, it reduces the taxes for them. If it's an elderly person and they've owned that property for a very long time, you know they may not have... Um, a cost basis. It could be zero. So they're going to have to pay taxes on the entire value of the sale. Well, if they can spread that out over five or 10 or 15 years, it may benefit them versus having to have that tax obligation all today, all at one time. Okay. So how to win more deals with creative financing. Closing more deals means, in fact, let me double check something here, folks. Unlocking the power, talked about that, what it is. Subject to, we touched on that, the benefits, nice. Okay, we got some more done before. I was just making sure I hadn't screwed this up. Let's go on back. How to win more deals with creative financing. I'm gonna move my little guy over there now. Okay, closing more deals means taking a creative approach to the financing. So how can you use creative financing to your advantage? Well, number one, understand the seller's motivation, okay? Find out why the seller is going to be selling the property or has interest in selling the property. All right. If they are motivated to sell quickly, creative financing may be a good option for them. Maybe a great option for you as well. Number two, be prepared with financing options. So again, this slide is how to win deals using it, right? You need to understand their motivation. They need to typically be motivated to want to do this or have a tax motivation or some, some level of motivation. Sometimes that motivation is just getting out from under the mortgage and the payments. Number two, be prepared with financing options, okay? Always have creative financing options available for the sellers. When you're out running your appointments, you know, if you have these tools in your belt ready to go versus in the truck or at home, you know, you're gonna be able to utilize them. So having the tools available just means understand creative financing and have some options available if they don't like your cash offer. Now, I wanna pause and talk about this for just a second. I'm typically always leading with a cash offer because the cash offer is the low offer that's going to make me the least amount of money. But also, it anchors them to let them know that I don't pay retail. I'm not really interested in paying retail for a property. What I am interested in is getting a discount in exchange for trading convenience to them. Typically, sellers that are motivated, they want convenience. They want to sell quickly. They want cash. And they want to sell it as is. They don't want to monkey around. Right? Well, there's a cost for that convenience and it's a discount, right? The more convenience I offer to a seller, the more discount on the property I'm typically looking to get. 
So to me personally, I use seller financing as a tool in my belt that I can offer after I've anchored low, okay, as well as um, went in with that, that low offer that is my cash offer, all right? Because if they want that offer, I'm not going to do seller financing. I'm going to get it for 30, 40,000 less and figure out the exit and make money quicker, okay? Um, if they want more or above what I'm willing to pay with my cash offer, which I've already anchored, pro tip there, anchoring, get them, get them low, start low so they know you're not paying big numbers. Then at that point, you can use creative financing. So again, but be prepared. Be ready to offer financing that can benefit both them and you. Okay, number three, ask the right questions. Make sure to ask the seller if they're willing to consider terms. This opens the door of creative financing options that can benefit both parties. So essentially, and we're gonna talk about terms in, in a minute. I believe the next slide is all about the terms. Yes, it is, but let's go back, all right? Ask the right questions. Essentially, when I go into a property appointment or I'm on the phone with the seller, I'm going to start low. I'm going to anchor. I'm going to use a cash offer because it's just going to make me the most money. And often that's the solution they want anyway. Okay. But if my offer is too low, they owe more or they're not willing to consider anywhere near my offer, then I say, well, hey, you know, that's my cash, cash offer buy it now price, you know? If you're willing to work with me and finance this property to me or let me take over your loan or something creative like that, which is essentially giving me terms, right? Let's not just do cash deal. Let's do a deal that has some terms involved, some, some creative approaches. I can probably pay you more. So that's all that number two being prepared is. It's just being able to ask the right questions and being able to present to them that you might be able to pay them more probably will be able to pay them more if they will be the bank and they will finance the deal to you, right? Or if you will let them take over the existing payment. So how to win more deals is what we just covered. One, two, three, simple. Understand it, be prepared, ask the right questions. What questions do you need to ask? I know that's probably the, the thing that's you know on most people's mind at this point. Well, let's talk about that, right? There's really only three things that matter when you're doing financing options. But keep in mind, there's an infinite amount of things that you and the seller could talk about and agree on, all right? So not every creative financing deal is gonna fit in the same box. It makes it so fun and beautiful. It's like, you know, you can just work out random deals with people, right? But typically when you're gonna talk about terms, you know, I, I'll tell a seller, here's my cash offer price, my buy it now price. I might be able to pay you more if you're willing to give me terms. And then they're gonna say, Dave, what's terms? And I'm gonna say, I'm glad you asked. There's really typically three things that matter. Number one, do are you going to require a down payment from me? Because that may kill the deal right away. If they say I need 20% down, if you want me to lend you the money and it's a $200,000 house, I'm going to need 40 grand to get into that deal. That might not make sense. It might if I want to fix and flip it and not have to go borrow the full money and just do that. So again, down payment, very important. I usually ask that first. <clears throat> excuse me, I just say, you know, well, usually I'm not trying to put money down. So are you going to require that from me? Because that may kill the terms altogether, right? I prefer zero down. Find out the minimum they would like to see. Sometimes that can be zero, right? Number two, term. Term, right? And amortization is also part of that. I don't want to complicate things. I'm going to keep it simple. I just start with the term. I just say, are you willing to finance the property for, you know, one to three years? I'm just throwing out numbers. I'm ballparking, you know, maybe five to 10. Or are you trying to do 30-year loans? Sometimes I'll just ask the seller that and just wait for the response and see how, you know, they respond. And if they say, oh, you're crazy, 30, you know, I, I'm interested in a couple. Okay, cool. Just learning. I'm just trying to figure out where me and you can, can, can align, right? Will there be a balloon or will the rate be adjustable? right? When this is really all up for negotiation. The reason I have amortization schedule in here as well is because I own uh, 60 properties right now, maybe 70. Um, and all of them have loans with banks. And the way that the bank loans work is the, the interest rate term versus the way that the loans calculated can be two different numbers. You can have a term and you can have an amortization. So for example, I bought, a, I refinanced a property today. I think I told you about this earlier. 
six and a half percent loan, five year fixed rate on the six and a half percent, but it's amortized over 25 years. So at the end of the five years, it renews to a new rate for five years, but I'm on year six of the amortization. So just like I do with my local banks and credit unions, you all can do with the seller. So you might even agree on a, you know, a five-year loan. And then let's just skip ahead for a second. The interest rate, that's the, really the next piece here, right in line, you know, at a low rate of 3%, but amortized over 20 years. And at the end of the five years, you either got to sell it or refinance it to pay back their loan, either to them or to their existing mortgage or loan that, that you take, took over. You know, pretty straightforward. But these are essentially the terms, right? There's three things to keep in mind. Number one, do they need money down? Are they going to require a bunch of money down? Number two, are they trying to, are they willing and, and okay and, and acceptable, you know, to do this for just a few years? Or are they willing to do this for a long time? And I know a lot of investors that buy apartment buildings with seller financing. In fact, seller financing is very common with bigger commercial properties and in apartment buildings because people don't have $3 million to go put down on a property that's worth 10. So they got to get the, the lend, they got to get the seller to finance them 20 or 30%, you know, though, but it's called carry, carry back. So seller financing or seller carry back. And then they'll go get a loan to cover the difference. Right. So it's very common, but what's their term. Right. And if they're not sophisticated, don't even mention amortization. If you're doing subject to it's irrelevant. It only matters if you're, dealing with a more sophisticated person and you're maybe trying to, you know, get the payment down. All right. And then last but not least is your interest rate. Sometimes the rate can be zero, no rate at all. Okay. Are you going to be paying them a low rate or a high rate? Or are you going to be paying interest only even while you rehab it? Some of the best ways that I like to use seller financing is to Use the seller to finance the purchase of the property over, let's say, six or eight months. I'll usually ask for a year, right? And then I will pay them interest only monthly or even at the end of that loan. So I don't have any money out of pocket unless I'm paying monthly interest, of course, to acquire the property. And if a property needs 30 or 40 grand worth of work, I can then just go get the 30 or 40 grand, which I have, or I can, I can use a credit card or a line of credit or a private lender. To go fix the property up. Let's say, here's the example, folks. This is such a great example. Say I got a property that, uh, you know, I can buy for 100 and it needs 30. And when it's all said and done, it's going to be worth 200. Pretty straightforward. $70,000 gross spread there. Okay. Well, instead of me needing $130,000 to do this deal, I can do this deal with 30000 or even none if I have credit cards. I can use the, the seller to be my lender on the first 100000 to purchase it. It needs work. That's why I'm getting a deal on it. Okay, so I don't need the 100 to buy it. And then I can go use the credit cards to rehab the property for the 30000 Okay, list it on the MLS, sell it. Let's say it sells for 200 I'm going to get 90% of that, which would be 180 180 minus the one, what did I say, 30 in repairs? Is fifty thousand gross? I'll make forty thousand or forty-five thousand dollars on that deal with no money out of pocket using creative financing. So that's some of my favorite ways to do it. You can also do it a hundred other ways. All right, so many different ways. Okay, where are we at? I think we got two more slides here. Let's rock and roll. Oh, I love this one, guys. Don't discount joint venturing. That's essentially what I just described to you in that last seller finance deal. I essentially joint ventured with the seller by paying them an interest rate and delaying them getting paid their money, right? But, I, but I'm reducing a lot of risk. I'm often paying them more than I would with my cash offer. And I'm going to go fix up a house that they essentially have a mortgage on. So if I don't pay them, they get to kick me out. So you got to keep your eyes and ears on the, on the target. You don't want to get kicked out. It won't happen if you pay the mortgage or pay the interest or stay on top of it. But again, that gives them the security in the deal. It's great. So make the seller your hard money lender, essentially. That's all you're doing here, folks, when you're doing this, right? There's often a seller that is not interested in seller financing over a long period of time. And from my personal experience, it's most. Most sellers aren't interested in doing 20 or 30 year loans with you, right? Unless they're super, super, super motivated. That's what they have left on their existing loan. And you can take that loan over, okay? But 
let's see, you might be interested in getting paid for a few months while you fix it up. That's what I, that was the example I just described before the slide. You can pay them an interest rate or all interest. And at the end, they're going to even get a percentage of your deal. I've done this so many times. So check this out. Here's a, another example where you can sell or finance with the deal. It's a real world example. It's one of my examples. There was an individual that had a property that um, they wanted to sell. It was worth about $400,000. It needed like 60. Okay. And I was trying to buy it for about $200,000. And they were like, David, that's way low. We can get more. And I said, yeah, absolutely you can. Go find that other person that, you know, is going to make you the offer. I, I, I hope you do. You know, I wasn't, you know, being rude. Of course, I wanted to buy it. But I'm just saying, if you could find somebody that can pay you more, take that. I'd be, I'd be willing to do it for 200 And they liked me, though. I was there. I built rapport. I hung out with them for 45 minutes. And, you know, they showed me all their great stuff. And. And at the end of the day, they were like, all right, we know that this thing needs, you know, about uh, maybe 60 or 70,000, give or take. And it's going to probably be worth 400, which is like a hundred and, you know, $40,000 gain. But there's a ton of risk. You need 200 grand to buy it and then another 60 or 70 to fix it. And I said, all right, there is a lot of risk if I go and I have to borrow all that money to do all that. So I said, why don't you all reduce my risk and I'll pay you more than 200? And they said, oh, terms, we're interested. And I said, all right, cool, how about this? You're right, those numbers don't, you're absolutely right. You know, the gross spread on this could be 140, I'll probably walk with 110. You know, that's a ton of money. And I said, I'll cut you in on it. I said, my buy price is 200, okay? And of my net profit, I'll give you 20% or 25%. So you're gonna get 200 minimum, you're going to get 25% of what I make. And you're going to sell or finance me the house until I fix it up and sell it. So I don't bring you 200 grand today. I bring you 200 grand plus 25% of what I make in six months when I sell it. It needs 60 or 70. I'll fund that. And they're sitting there thinking, well, that's kind of a great deal. They're like, we don't really know what that number is going to be because we don't really know what your gross profit is. But if we're expecting roughly or net profit in this case is you know roughly 110 that's an extra 30,000 that's 230,000 instead of 200 or having to go shop a bunch of other people to win this deal and I said it's actually really great because I'm incentivized to make as much as I possibly can because I'm only going to get 75% of it I don't need to come with 200 extra thousand to get control of it I'll owe that to you and I only got to go pull 60 or 70 that's going to be super easy to a private investor a private lender is that can basically get 60 and triple it. You interested? I might even partner with them too. And that's a deal I actually did. They said, Dave, cool. We're going to do, and I always ask for a year. I say, give me a year. I'm going to have it rehabbed in three or four months. And we're going to have it listed and sold within six. But I don't want you coming at me and getting mad. So like just 12 months is the typical loan term. Thanks, Holly. Just throw it over there. That's perfect. And that's what we did. So we seller finance a deal. 200000 I put 70 in it. We ended up selling it for 390. They got 200 and 30 grand roughly. They were super happy. I paid them more, but I used seller financing to get creative. And the whole point of this slide right here is don't discount the joint venture. You can use seller financing folks to joint venture with your sellers and offer to pay them more money while simultaneously making it easier to get it a hold of the deals while simultaneously reducing your risk. Wow, that's a tongue twister and just filled with value. I love it. All right, one more slide, I believe. Conclusions and takeaways. All right, I love it. Let me get my little, uh, my big head out of your guys' way here. And we can even make this a little bigger too, like that. Okay, perfect. Move this up here. Let's talk about it. And then we can open up the Q&A here for all my real estate school folks. Conclusions and takeaways, guys. Creative financing is such a powerful tool, okay? This is such a powerful tool that we can both benefit ourselves, the buyers, and the sellers in a real estate transaction. Keep these takeaways in mind, okay? Seller financing and subject to financing are just two great examples of creative financing. But there are many, 
many, many ways to go about doing creative financing. You're not limited to just, you know, just something small. Like there's a million ways, just what works with you and the seller. Joint venturing is one of my favorite ways that I just mentioned. Both options are going to offer benefits to both parties, assuming they want those benefits. Somebody that wants a cash offer and to be done, that's not a benefit to them. It's got to be a motivated seller that is looking for a certain price, needs out quick, or in most cases, from my experience, can't afford to keep paying the payments anymore. And they just, they got to move on, but they don't want to wreak havoc on their credit. Understand the seller's motivation to see if creative financing is an option. Again, it kind of goes with what I just said, right? If they're not motivated enough, if that's not their motivation, if their motivation's cash, it might not be a good option. But by understanding the seller's motivation, it's going to be an easy way for you to go pull that tool out of your belt and say, have you ever heard of terms? Let's talk about terms. Maybe we can work out a deal with some terms that you might like that make you more money and or slow down you getting paid for advantage for purposes that will you know make it an advantage to you. Next would be be prepared with the financing options like I just mentioned. Just mentioned. You guys got this imaginary tool belt on. You got to start filling it with things. Purchase and sale contracts, the main thing you get, right? Option agreements, credibility packets, seller financing tools. You got to fill up your belt, hypothetically speaking, right? And last but not least, creative financing can help you close more deals and stand out in a competitive market, which we're in now. We're in a competitive market because it's going to offer you more options and more takeaways to the sellers. But again, guys and girls, there are so many amazing benefits um, to reduce your risk and to not have to go get a loan from a bank if you don't have good credit or some capital to invest. Or maybe you, you know, can't qualify for other reasons. You don't make enough money or you're new to your, your LLC is new and you don't have two or three years of, of taxes to, to show the bank that you're, you know, legit. So many different reasons. So amazing, amazing, amazing. I want to review really quick before we move on. Don't discount the joint venture. Love that one. Uh, the financing options. This is what you're going to talk about when you're talking about terms, guys. Down payment, term interest rate. The one thing I don't have on here, and, and, I, and it's funny, somebody said the other day, Dave, you got, you got to add number four, like purchase price. Guys, that's presumed. In order to get to the, to, to the purchase price, you need these three things. If I'm going to be paying somebody 27% interest, my purchase price is low. If I got 0% interest, I'm willing to pay more, much more. So just keep that in mind. It's presumed that you are talking about the purchase price and you move levers. These three things are the levers that you're moving that's going to make the number that you're willing to pay go up and down. If they're going to make your life convenient, the number is going to go up that you're going to be willing to pay them. Like in my scenario, went from 200 to 230 with some creativity and less risk for me. But these are the terms. The fourth one, again, is the purchase price, but it's presumed in my opinion. Okay, what else do we got? How to win more deals. Guys, understand their motivation. Be prepared with the options and ask the right questions. Are you interested in seller financing? Have you heard of it? Do you know what terms is? Let me, let me introduce you to some creativity, some creative things that you and I can do to help you, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, get out of this situation that you're probably not happy about being in and you're, you're wanting out. What else? Benefits. It benefits everybody. We went over that multiple, multiple times. Subject to, super simple. Find a seller, agree on a price, take over their payments, agree on the terms. And then, of course, the whole presentation is all about seller financing, guys. So to wrap this up, keep it simple. Don't overthink it. Seller financing is an amazing tool that we can use. Again, to me, it's a tool that I don't lead with. Some investors in the around the country do, and that's great. I love it. Go good for them. I want to buy low. And if I can get them to accept a cash offer that's low, I can figure out the financing. I can secure private money, hard money, bank loans, whatever I need to do. I'll go to wholesale it if I have to. The lowest number is typically the easiest number for in terms of reducing your risk and, and also increasing your profits. 
But I said this earlier, I want to repeat this. It also anchors. That is such a good thing to think about or a valuable and an important thing. You don't want to go talk to a seller and, you know, this estimate's 270 and they're asking 260 and say, yeah, maybe we can get close. Guys, you're nowhere near that number. You're at 175. So I'm going to offer 175. And they're going to say, whoa, I was thinking 260. This guy's offering 175. Like, I need to reconsider that number. Ooh, they're coming way down. So definitely keep those things in mind. But again, don't overcomplicate it. Lead with, well, maybe I can pay you more, assuming you make your cash offer first. Maybe you can pay more by using some creative tools. But again, some people that are new, they're going to sometimes want to get super creative and offer a seller a number that's above and beyond the true value of the property. So my advice would be, even though you're going to be using creative finance and adding this tool to your belt today with this training, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to still want to be buying properties from sellers or, or, or taking over mortgages subject to, unless in my opinion, you're at at least 90% of ARV minus repairs or less. Reason is, is because 90% of ARV minus repairs is the as-is value. And if you go buy a property from somebody subject to, and you get hit by a bus, I know it sounds crazy, and you need to get rid of this thing, that's your break-even. So it doesn't really, ma it doesn't make sense to me when anybody around the country is like, oh, I'll pay 100% of, of, uh, of its true value. If they have to turn around and sell it in a fire sale, they lose 10%. No. 90% or less, the only reason that you'd ever really going to go above that is if they're going to do something crazy with you, right? Long 25, 30, 40 year term, you know, okay, we can talk about those things. But typically speaking, whenever you're doing seller financing, you still want to be able to get the property at a discount, folks. We make our money when we buy, we get paid when we sell. So keep that in mind. Don't be going out there and over offering on properties. You can offer more than your cash offer. Absolutely. Not saying you can't do that. I'm just saying, don't use this to get so aggressive that you're making bad deals. And I feel like a lot of people jump into seller financing. Oh, subject two is great. And then they go buy a property subject two that's underwater. That doesn't make sense to me. So again, we still need to be savvy investors and make good offers. This tool just allows us to get creative and it allows us to pay more than those cash offers, but still make good offers, all right? Keep that low. All right. We got a few people on today. Very cool. If you guys have any questions about creative financing, let's open it up for a quick Q&A, and then we can wrap it up in a couple minutes here. Got to have something for me, Richard or Bryce. What you guys got? So um, I, uh, I have some rough uh terms written down that i've gleaned off of the interwebs or some other um people and i guess my biggest misunderstanding on creative terms is like just like you said what is a good deal and what isn't um so if something was going to be like they want the zillow price and there's no budget and you're like well throw this lead away is it still, let's say Zillow is maybe even right at market or a little higher than market is zero down and say better than bank financing a good deal or what constitutes? I'm know, not sure I'm understanding the question fully. I think I understand. Ask it one more time. I'm just curious. You know what well, I'm saying? Uh, yeah. So just like you said, you know, you don't want to make an offer on something that's uh, underwater, obviously, but. You're I've asking heard, like how close to the line is it? Like, where's the line? Yeah, because I've yeah. heard people say, you know, well, if, they, if they're not budgeting on price and they're at Zillow, price, and I'm just using Zillow as an example, let's say sure. it's $10,000 below market price. Sure. It's a price that you're like, ah, that's not a deal normally for cash offer, right? By a long ways, you're like, right. I don't even know um, if I do that. But then you hear people say creative financing, uh, if you can get it for the right terms. Well, so some of those terms are thrown around, obviously, 0% uh, down. And I've heard five 
five to seven percent ideally or below that uh yeah i mean it's ideal to have no money down or less and it's ideal to have no interest or less whatever number you throw out three five seven it's relevant what are you paying your current private money lender 14 percent pay the seller 10 that's a deal you're getting less you're getting less interest than your current so it's very relative if that makes sense um also the line that's kind of where i'm what i'm hearing it's like where's the line the yeah. line's gray because what are they offering you you see what i'm saying so like to me i would never so here's my line I'll, I'll just throw it out there i'm not hiding anything i'm an open book guys you should know that by now the my line is i'm 90 percent of arv minus repairs my arv is conservative and my repairs are liberal so what does that mean? That means if I get hit by a bus and can't walk, but I'm still alive and I'm trying to just clean my life up, I could make money on that wholesale deal because I've, I've been conservative on my ARVs, right? I mean, at least list it and, and make a few bucks. I wouldn't lose probably. I'd break even at a minimum, right? I'm reducing my risk. Okay. And that doesn't really matter to me really on any time frame. Now, the only thing is, is if a seller says, hey, Dave, you know, I want you to pay me full ARV, but there's no interest and I'll do a 30 year loan. I might even pay him 120% of the ARV, no interest, 30 year loan, because in 30 years, that property is going to be worth three times what it is today. And I'm only paying 120%, not 300%. So it's like, it's just, it's so hard to find a line because these are levers, down payment uh, term and interest rate. They're levers. As I move one, my price slides up and down. I move this one, price slides. I move this one. So these levers, yeah. all it's all you, you can't just okay. say one of them. I need to know all three to then calculate, like, oh, okay, you're gonna give me that much time, or you don't need any interest, or oh, you need 10% down. All right, that changes things. You see what I'm saying? They all yeah. kind of play in. But the great thing is, is there's really not a hundred thousand things. There's three down payment, interest rate, and term. And then terms kind of two part. If you're if you're sophisticated, you can say, all right, five year, but amortized over 10 or 15, your payment comes down. You're gonna owe them more money at the end of the term. You know, maybe there's maybe it's 10 year, you know, term, but 10 year amort at the end, you don't owe them anything. It's paid off. It 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 varies on these levers. So I'm trying to hopefully I'm painting a good, a good picture here of you know, of, of yeah. a machine with levers, right? Because as you move one up and down, it's gonna adjust your 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 output. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But you know, if you come across something posted in school, man, this is what the community is all about. We'll take a look. We'll tell you what we would do. You know, I mean, yeah. my goal at this point, after buying and selling and flipping, you know, almost a thousand properties, when I look at a property, I'm not even looking at how much money I can make guys. I'll be honest. It crosses my mind. It obviously, you don't want to know how I really look at it at this point. It's like, all right, at this number, I could screw up, forget about it, go on vacation, go over budget and sell it for less than I think and still break even. That's where I want to be. I'm looking at my offers now as how do I reduce my risk to nothing? And if I make something great, if I make a lot, even better. I'm not looking at like, oh, I, I got to be here to make 30. No, it's like I could screw up five ways and break even. That's low enough. We're going with that number. You know what I'm saying? So it's the same with seller financing. It's like, because again, there can be so many different, like it's, it's difficult. Seller financing is a difficult thing to teach because it's not just like, oh, here's the template. Yeah. here's the. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wish it was guys. I really do. But, but here's the thing. That's why it's so awesome because it's not just a template. It's right. whatever you and me think is a win-win. So hopefully that kind of helps some, clear it up a little bit. Like, guys, it can be anything. But those are the levers that you're going to be moving, essentially, to determine what that anything is over here. Right. Right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome question, man. Awesome. And then All right. We got, we got time for a couple more, say, guys. What you got? Um, okay. So. Oh, go ahead, Bryce. I was just going to say then uh, also whether it's a good deal also depends on whether – you know, what you're using it for, whether you're going to use it for a rental or. Um, Absolutely. And that's kind of, kind of like, 
the, so the exit you use you use your end result to determine like what the price is right what exit you'd want to go with is that my computer guys i'm sorry there we go um you see what i'm saying so like if i'm going to do a fix and flip on a property and and i'm and i'm not having to buy it before i you know or you go resource go go you know um get the capital secure the financing is the word i'm looking for if i, if I have to go secure the financing Makes my life a little bit more difficult. Not hard. I can do that. No problem. I, I got that. But I got to go do that. It's work. But the seller is just like, you don't need to do that. I'll do that. How much are you going to pay your lender? You can give him 10 grand of interest. Give me that 10 grand of interest. Deal. Oh my God. Oh, this is amazing. You want to you finance me the rehab too? I'll pay you 15% on that. And if they have it, they may do that. I've had sellers finance me deals and give me money to fix it up and then pay them the interest or splits. In the, in the end, like I talked about earlier. And here's the thing that I think a lot of individuals, you know, there's two things I think individuals that are new either don't do well or fail at. Number one, I mentioned already, they overpay with overfinancing because they're just happy to get control of a property, but the deal isn't good. You know, right. so like, just again, it still needs to be a good deal, guys. You may be willing to overpay if the deal makes sense and it's super long with no interest. Like again, it's terms, right? The second thing that I often see um, mistake made is, let's see here. I just was thinking about it. I'd totally draw a blank here. So it's a bad deal or, oh, or they're not aggressive enough with the joint venture play. So they're just really trying to convince the seller to give them a really long time frame or a really low rate and the seller's just not having it. Guys, when I first started, I was giving sellers 50% of the deal just to work with me. Now it's like, I'll give you 25% and it's going to be a big number. So you're going to love it. You know, I have more leverage in the, in the negotiation because I have experience and I have credibility and I have you know, things I can show them that I've done to prove that I know what I'm doing, right? But in the beginning, I feel like a lot of investors, they'll let deals slide or they won't get aggressive enough in terms of, the joint venture opportunities with the sellers and, and same with hard and private, more so private money lenders, guys. One of the best ways to get a private money lender is to find a home run deal and not even necessarily get them to lend it to you on an interest rate, but on a fixed percentage of profits. You're going to go make 50 grand. The lender gets 25. They get half. They've never lent to you before. They're not really interested in 10 or 12%. But they want, they want 25K. And then you do a deal or two with them. And then all of a sudden you go back to them and you say, hey, I got these other people that are, you know, willing to do it for like 10 or 12% versus 50% of my net spread. They're doing it 10 or 12% annualized. You know, like I want to keep working with you, but I'm just, I'm giving away too much. You know, if you want to keep working with me, great. I'd love it, but I, I'd rather just pay you 10 or 12% annualized interest Versus a big spread, but in but the whole point here, guys, in the beginning, do whatever you got to do to gain the trust of the seller or of private lender. And I know I'm switching gears to, 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 to make a partner, to build a friendship, to get a relationship that you can keep utilizing. Sometimes you got to go above and behind. And again, that's number two, right? Number one, new people or inexperienced people, they're overpay or they don't do the good deal. Number two is they don't get creative enough to build their business. Sometimes in the beginning, you got to give it all away. Not all, but you got to be very, very liberal with your profits and share it with people to build their trust. Now, I don't joint venture with private money lenders. I make them compete for my business and maybe even get them down to 8% on some of my deals because they know that they're getting their money back. I've done it 700 times. They're like, yep, David pays. I don't need to go off of that, right? But in the beginning, that's what I did. Especially when I meet a new lender, man, even to, to, this, to this day, when I meet a new lender, I might kick them 10 or 15% of the first deal. And they're going to be like, what's this extra three grand? I'm going to be like, it's a thank you. You want to keep lending me money? Three grand out of 30. I'm not that worried about it, right? But you got to go the extra mile to build the relationships. This is about seller financing and it applies because you got to do that with the seller. But one of the biggest questions I get from new other individuals is, where do I go get the money from? Guys, get creative. It's very similar. It's in the same lane here, essentially. 
Awesome. Bryce, great questions. Richard, I got time for one more, man. You got one for me? You gotta have something. What do you uh, think? How did, how did you like the presentation? It was good. Uh, would this be applicable to uh, wholesaling as well or just flipping? Yeah, and... kind of. I mean, when you're wholesaling, you're using paperwork to gain control of a property and you're not typically buying it. At least I don't like to. I want to gain control of a property with a piece of paper and I want to go sell my paper to somebody else. That's 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 really wholesaling, right? Um, but you could you can you can here's the great thing. You can wholesale anything. Walmart does every, everything in their store. They're wholesaling it. They're buying it cheap. They're selling it retail to you. That's all the wholesaling is. Buy it great, sell it good, right? So you could go structure a deal with a seller for seller financing and, and then wholesale it to a rehabber like me. I'd love that. Or go, hold, go structure a, a subject to deal from a really distressed person that doesn't want any money. They just want to get out and they don't want their credit getting destroyed. And you can go get that under contract as a subject too. And then you can find a landlord that wants to take over that subject too and own it and rent it and manage it. And you can wholesale that to them. It's just, you can wholesale anything. It's just, do you have a buyer for it? And you, and then in those scenarios you do. Yes, absolutely. Um, does that make sense? Wholesaling is just taking something great and just passing it to somebody else good. And you're making that spread in between. So if you can structure a deal with terms, you can wholesale that deal all day, assuming it's a good deal. You know, can't wholesale bad stuff, right? That's a lot of people will get a good deal, but it's not great. And they're like, why can't I wholesale it? And it's like, because you're trying to sell it above what people are willing to pay. I would pay what you paid. We both would. Great work. But if you don't get it great and give it to me good still, and leave some meat on that bone, it's a dead deal for everybody. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome, 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 guys. All right, guys, thank you so much for attending Real Estate School. This is another free training all about creative financing, which essentially consists of using the seller to finance your deals and or to partner with them and or to take over their existing mortgages. And there's even other endless ways to do this. But again, keep it simple. Approach them. Have this tool in your belt. Utilize terms, interest, down payment. Um, and you know duration with them to see if it makes sense to pay more. If they're motivated, it's going to be easier to do so. Uh, but the last thing I want to say, I think I said it twice, I'm going to say it one more time before we wrap up. Just because we have these new tools in our belt doesn't mean we need to go be making bad offers and bad deals. Can we pay more? Yes. Can we pay a lot more? Maybe. It depends on those factors, right? How much down? How long and, you know, what kind of rate are they wanting to get in return for, for working and partnering with you? And then last but not least, PPS. <laughs> Don't discount the joint venture, guys. I do more joint ventures, I feel like, with sellers than I, than I do seller financing. I seller finance properties to people in my market as like lease options or even just I'll be your lender, right, on the exit. But on the purchase, I'm doing more joint ventures with sellers then I am actually getting them to sell me a property with seller financing. So that's why I say don't discount it, guys. All right, rocking and rolling, guys. Thanks for attending. Signing off. Household easy, we close fast and anytime that works for you. Your house don't need it. We'll throw cash. It hits so fast, don't know what to do. Wanted to care to